Well, as always here in Paradoxes, I'll teach for roughly 30 minutes, and then we'll take questions uh, from the live audience as well as from the virtual audience, and you can ask any question you want on any subject. And what I'm speaking on uh, this today is number three, part three, in the series we're doing where I'm reviewing some of the highlights of this book, uh, Design to the Core, uh, that has just come out a few weeks ago. It'll be released to the public on September 1st, but anyone can get an advanced copy for a donation of any amount uh, to Reasons to Believe. And uh, you can also get a free chapter of this book, The Creator in the Cosmos, now in its fourth edition, by going to reasons.org slash Ross. And uh, you can get free chapters of any of the books that are published by RTB Press uh, by going to reasons.org uh, slash Ross. Now the theme of uh, Design to the Core is that uh, there are many books written on the fine-tuned designs of the universe, but they typically stop at the level of the universe as a whole. And the theme of Design to the Core is that we see an overwhelming case for extraordinarily fine-tuned, exquisitely fine-tuned designs to make possible the existence of humans on all cosmic size scales from the very largest size scales down to the very smallest size scales. So what I'm gonna be doing in the next few weeks here is uh, taking you from the universe, which we've done in previous episodes. By the way, if you missed the last two, uh, they are archived at uh, paradoxes.org. You can download them and listen to them or watch them uh, at your convenience. Uh, but today I'm gonna be looking at the fine-tuned features of our super galaxy cluster. And uh, last time I was speaking here, I showed you the latest maps that astronomers have produced of the largest scale structures of the universe. And what you see in those largest scale structures are super, super clusters of galaxies. And you say, what do you mean by this? Well, a cluster of galaxies is where you've got hundreds to thousands of galaxies that are in a cluster. A super cluster is basically a cluster of clusters of galaxies, and a super, super galaxy cluster is a cluster of super galaxy clusters. And that's what you see in the largest size scales, literally thousands of these super, super galaxy clusters. Now, where we live uh, within the universe, there are no super, super galaxy clusters that are nearby. That's actually an essential ingredient for life. If you want to have complex life, you had to be living in an under-dense region of the universe where there are no super, super galaxy clusters. But there are super galaxy clusters. And uh, this next image here basically shows you how astronomers define a super galaxy cluster. In fact, this wasn't even possible until 2014. That's the first time that astronomers are able to recognize. They've always been able to recognize galaxy clusters but not super uh, galaxy clusters. Now, what astronomers have done, this is a map, every dot here is a galaxy uh, or a cluster of galaxies. And so this basically shows you the several million nearby galaxies. And uh, that little red dot that you see there, that's where we live. And so we live in this uh, super galaxy cluster and what astronomers attempted to do to try to define larger scale structures is that we live in an expanding universe. And the expansion velocity is something that we can predict from the Big Bang creation event. Basically, the greater the distance, the faster the galaxy moves away from us. It's highly predictable. But what astronomers were interested in, how do galaxies interact with one another? And so, they took the million nearest galaxies and they removed the expansion velocity. And so every one of the galaxies here is moving away from us because of the ex uh, Big Bang uh, uh, expansion characteristic of the universe. So they took out the velocity due to the expansion of the universe. And what you see here are the velocities that are left over. And the blue colors represent galaxies that are moving away, and the yellow colors are galaxies that are moving towards the center. 
And so in every case, the expansion velocity has been taken out. Because as it turns out, all the galaxies that are in our vicinity are moving away from one another. And so this structure you see here is in the process of being dispersed. The galaxies are going to move away, and uh, all the structure you see there is basically going to disappear. Uh, but what they did is they said, let's take out the velocities due to the expansion of the universe, see what's left over. And what they discovered is everywhere where you see those uh, yellow or orange lines, that's basically galaxies that are moving towards a common center. The blue velocities are galaxies that are moving away. And if you get beyond that yellow area and move out, you'll find other places where if you take out the expansion velocity of the universe, you see that the galaxies are clustering together, and beyond that, the galaxies are moving away. And so this next slide here actually shows you the detailed structure of the super galaxy cluster in which we live. Uh, they discovered this back in 2014, and they were doing the research in Hawaii, so they gave it a Hawaiian name. It's called the Lania Kaya Super Galaxy Cluster. The little red dot there shows you where our local group of galaxies is. Uh, now, what really stunned astronomers, and they came up with this map of the local super galaxy cluster, is how different it looks from all other super galaxy clusters that we can measure in the nearby universe. Uh, the one that's been recognized even before the Lanakai super galaxy cluster was discovered is the Shapley supercluster. Uh, matter of fact, the grandson of Hartle Shapley uh, was a regular attender of this class. And uh, his grandfather, Harlow Shapley, was the one that discovered uh, this particular supercluster of galaxies. And what I want you to notice is how different our super galaxy cluster looks from the nearby Shapley supercluster. And so here we see literally hundreds of clusters of galaxies, but notice the shape. They're jammed tightly together, and you're basically seeing a football shape uh, structure. And so the galaxies and galaxy clusters are much more uh, densely clustered than an Atlantikaya supercluster. And uh, this is typical. And so where the Lanakaya stands out, it does not have a basketball-shaped structure or a football-shaped structure. As a matter of fact, it kind of looks like uh, some kind of a, a horse, a dog. Uh, uh, they've likened it to a praying mantis uh, insect where you've got a prominent head and you've got these long uh, filaments that stretch out. And you look at the Shapley supercluster galaxies, you don't really see any of these structured filaments. You've basically got the clusters of galaxies all jammed tightly together. Now, this makes the Shapley supercluster a non-candidate for advanced life. The galaxy clusters are jammed too tightly together. The galaxies in the galaxy clusters are also jammed too tightly together. And when that happens, you get a lot of infall of gas and stars uh, towards the largest galaxy uh, or galaxies within the clusters, and you get these supermassive black holes that radiate out deadly radiation. And so the problem for life in the Shapley supercluster is that you've got way too massive bodies, far too close. It means that any galaxy there is going to have its structure uh, distorted. I mentioned last time I was here, if you want to have life in a galaxy, it has to be a spiral galaxy. Because only in a spiral galaxy do you have the stars far enough apart from one another uh, where uh, planets orbiting a star are not going to be gravitationally disturbed over a long time span. That's a crucial feature for life. It's also important uh, that your life-sustaining planet be far away from any deadly radiation. That's simply not going to happen, the Shapley supercluster. You've got uh, way too high a density of mass, and so gravitational disturbances are inevitable, and likewise deadly radiation is inevitable. Well, the Shapley supercluster 
is the closest super galaxy cluster to our Lanakaya supercluster. But there are others that are almost as nearby. And so this shows you the Perseus Pisces uh, supercluster of galaxies. And uh, you do see some filaments here, unlike what you see in the Shapley supercluster. But notice the filaments you do see are still very dense conglomerations of uh, big clusters of galaxies. And once again, uh, the density of galaxies is too high to permit a site uh, where advanced life could be possible. And likewise, it's inevitable that you're going to have uh, way too many supermassive black holes radiating out uh, deadly radiation. Uh, the smallest uh, supercluster we see, by the way, the Lanakaya supercluster, of all the superclusters that we can see in the nearby universe, it is the least massive. All the others are way more massive. Uh, but this is one of the, quote, smaller ones, still far more massive than the Lanakaya supercluster. And, uh, but here again, you see that the galaxy clusters are jammed really tightly together. And uh, once again, uh, you're going to have gravitational disturbances and uh, deadly radiation sites from the supermassive black holes. And uh, one term I coined in uh, design to the core is astronomers define a black hole as a supermassive black hole if it comes in at more than one million times the mass of our star, the sun. But the ones that are a problem for advanced life is what I call uh, the super, super massive black holes. These are black holes that come in at more than a billion times the mass of our star, the sun. And uh, the closest one we know of is in the Virgo cluster. There's one there that has a mass of six and a half billion times the mass of our star, the sun. And these super, super massive black holes, uh, without exception, are pouring out deadly radiation. And radiation is such an intensity, it's not only a problem for life within the galaxy where the super, super massive black hole resides, it's actually a problem for nearby all the galaxies in the vicinity of the galaxy hosting the super, super massive black hole. Well, here's another one. This is the Ursa Major supercluster. I'm basically showing you the super galaxy clusters that are in the vicinity of the one in which we live in, the Lanakaya uh, super galaxy cluster. This is what's called Ursa Major super galaxy cluster. And here we see a structure where the galaxy clusters are kind of strung out along an arc. That's a typical feature. But notice, in spite of being strung out in a long arc, you still ha have these galaxy clusters uh, very big and j jammed tightly together. So here you see four big prominent knots. And here the density of galaxies and galaxy clusters is even greater than what we see in the Shapley uh, supercluster galaxies, which is the biggest and most massive of all the super galaxy clusters in our vicinity. And uh, the one that uh, is cons part of the local neighborhood of super galaxy clusters, uh, but is fairly distant. And uh, this has the longest arc of all. I mean, compared to this one, uh, uh, I mean, the arc we see in the Ursa Major supercluster, uh, it's about one quarter to one fifth of the length of the arc you see in the Horologium uh, supercluster galaxies. So this one actually competes with the Shapley supercluster for being the most massive supergalaxy cluster uh, in our uh, vicinity. So it covers a much larger spatial uh, realm than the Shapley supercluster galaxies. Uh, but instead of being football shaped, it's kind of distributed Mark. along an arc. Pardon me? Mark the yes, yes. Uh, but once again, uh, you see these very uh, huge, those big dots you see there, those are all galaxy clusters. But notice uh, that the galaxies in them are jammed very tightly together. And every one of those big bright dots you see, you're going to have one or more super, super massive uh, black holes. And so there's deadly radiation all throughout this uh, horologium 
a supercluster of galaxies. And the point I'm making here is that when we look at uh, the Lanakaya supercluster of galaxies, it's radically different. And uh, astronomers have the capacity to see these super galaxy clusters almost out to the full extent of the universe. They've been looking ever since 2014 for a super galaxy cluster that's sufficiently like the one we live in that it could be a candidate to host advanced life, and they've not found any. And so, again, tens and tens of thousands of these super galaxy clusters. And so far, everywhere we looked in the universe, we see only one that's a candidate to host advanced life. Now, there have been papers published where they said, perhaps we could have microbes existing in one of these other super galaxy clusters, but because of the deadly radiation and because of the gravitational disturbances, microbes, as simple as they are, uh, would only be existing for a relatively short period of time. Uh, for these other super galaxy clusters, no question they're not a candidate for advanced life, but they could be a candidate to host uh, microbes or bacteria uh, for a relatively short uh, period of time. Now, what's unique about the Lanakaya supercluster, number one, notice that the really big clusters of galaxies are all off to the right. The Virgo cluster, the Centaurus cluster, the Hydra cluster, they're all over to the far right side of the Lanakaya supercluster. And where are we? We're that little red dot. So as you can see, we're nowhere close to any big cluster of galaxies. Uh, there are some nearby groupings of galaxies, uh, but no uh, cluster. Uh, the nearest one uh, would be the Fornax cluster and the Virgo cluster, but both of them are more than 50 million light years away. So we're a long ways uh, from any of the clusters of galaxies. And if you look at the groupings of galaxies, the M81 group, the LEO1 group, M94 group, uh, the Maffei group, that's the closest one to us. Uh, what you notice uh, that uh, we live in the smallest grouping of galaxies. Now, for advanced light to be possible, your spiral galaxy must be residing in a group of galaxies. You need to be in a group of galaxies because it's important for the spiral galaxy that's the home for advanced life uh, that it be feeding on a diet of tiny dwarf galaxies. And it needs to be feeding on a diet literally of several hundred of these tiny dwarf galaxies over the past 10 billion years. And that's only going to be possible if you're in a local group of galaxies. So as you see in this particular image here, there are huge voids. So for example, if you look at the lower center, you really don't see any groupings of galaxies at all. And so yeah, there could be a galaxy there that'd be far enough away from the big clusters there as not to be exposed to any uh, super, super massive black hole. Uh, on the other hand, being in such a void, it's not gonna have the diet that it needs. There won't be a sufficient density of tiny dwarf galaxies that it can gravitationally draw in and you say, why do we need these tiny dwarf galaxies? Well, I'll be talking about that next time I'm here when we look at the local group that we're in. Uh, but uh, it's these tiny dwarf galaxies are extraordinary in that they're extremely gas rich and star poor. Not a lot of stars, but a lot of gas and a lot of dark matter, matter that doesn't strongly interact with light. And our Milky Way galaxy, by ingesting these tiny dwarf galaxies, it basically pulls in gas and dark matter as it consumes these tiny dwarf galaxies. And that gas and dark matter uh, streaming into the core of our galaxy is what sustains the density waves that establish the spiral structure of the spiral arms. And for a variety of reasons, life is only possible, advanced life is only possible uh, if indeed the host star is in a spiral arm where that spiral arm is sufficiently far away from the center of the galaxy that it's not exposed 
to gravitational disturbances from massive stars or deadly radiation from the supermassive black hole. All big galaxies have supermassive black holes. Our galaxy is one as well. And so it's important uh, that we be orbiting a star uh, that's sufficiently far away from the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy uh, that it's, not, it's radiation is not going to bring about our demise. And hey, just to make a little segue here, uh, you know, Mormonism is a religion based on the Old New Testament, but they add three other books. I call it kind of like uh, the second uh, Islamic religion. You know, Islam and Mormonism are both religions based on the Old New Testament, where they have a latter-day prophet and a latter-day book or set of books. But in the case of Mormonism, uh, the book of Abraham, uh, Abraham 3, uh, makes the point that life first originated, advanced life first originated at the center of our galaxy uh, on a planet with a 1,000-day rotation period. Well, a 1,000-day rotation period is a problem, but a far bigger problem is they've got this home planet for advanced life in our galaxy at the center of our galaxy. At the center of our galaxy is a supermassive black hole weighing in at 4 million times the mass of our star, the sun. We're about 26,000 light years away from it, so the radiation is not a problem for us, but it certainly would be a problem for someone trying to explain how Mormonism is a credible religion. Uh, the radiation there is far too deadly. Uh, I wrote an article on this master planet Kolob. That's what the Mormons refer to, uh, this planet Kolob, uh, where life began in our Milky Way galaxy. And I wound up getting a letter from Salt Lake City uh, from the headquarters of uh, uh, Mormonism. And they basically said, uh, we're disturbed because you actually took Abraham 3 literally uh, about what it says. And I said, well, the text I've got here has a facing page to Abraham 3, which basically encourages people interpreting Abraham 3 to take that chapter literally. So I just did exactly what your Bible took. And hey, uh, the version I have is 20 years old. Uh, if you people have actually updated things and changed things, I'll make a public statement that, that your new position is that you don't take it literally and that uh, you have decided that these old versions of Abraham 3 uh, are no longer to be interpreted the way you used to say. Well, I found out that they still take it literally. Uh, so I didn't have to write a retraction, uh, but that is a problem uh, for the Mormon faith not a problem for what the Bible says, because the Bible is basically saying it's Earth that's a home uh, for advanced life. Now, again, going back to this uh, uh, figure you see here, notice that we're in the smallest grouping of galaxies. The galaxy groups around the local group are all quite a bit bigger, big enough that, yes, a spiral galaxy, these other ones have spiral galaxies in them, but the spiral galaxies are close together, and by being close together, they gravitationally disturb one another. The local group has two big galaxies, our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy, both spiral galaxies, but they're far apart from one another. And in the local group, there are no giant galaxies. Giant galaxies are where you're going to get these big, uh, supermassive uh, black holes. Our local group has no giant galaxies. It's got two large galaxies. It's got five medium-sized uh, dwarf galaxies, and it's got 200 tiny dwarf galaxies. And it probably had 1,000 tiny dwarf galaxies billions of years ago, but both the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy have been consuming these tiny dwarf galaxies. But only the Milky Way galaxies have been consuming them at just the right rate. I'll talk about that again when we get into the uh, local group. But again, making the point. Now, what you see here in the Lanakaya supercluster is that the galaxy clusters and the grouping of galaxies are all along these big filaments. 
And so you've got a filament extending from the Centaurus cluster through the Virgo cluster uh, to the M94 group, and you continue on, it goes all the way out to the Pavo cluster at the upper right uh, of that figure. Then you also see a filament right going down towards the Hydra cluster at the lower right, and you see another big filament going down uh, to the Eridanus cluster on the lower left. Now, what's special about the local group? It's a grouping of galaxies. It's not on a major filament. Uh, astronomers have now discovered that the local group is on a nexus of three subfilaments of the Lanakaya supercluster. Uh, but again, if we go back to these other super galaxy clusters we're looking at, like the Shapley, like the Leo, you really don't see filaments, and you don't see subfilaments. So subfilaments are unique uh, to the Lanakaya supercluster, and it's because we're at the nexus of three subfilaments, you can have this small grouping of galaxies that's got just the right density of tiny dwarf galaxies, no giant galaxies, and only two uh, medium uh, large uh, galaxies. Now, before I get to the Q&A, something you'll also see in the book Design of the Core, I show this figure. And what we're looking at here is what's called the dipole map of the cosmic background radiation. And so, uh, the blue represents a cooler region of the temperature profile of the universe and the orange, a hotter region. Now, the temperature difference between the blue and the uh, uh, orange, it's about uh, oh, uh, 0 0.0002 degrees Kelvin. So uh, we're talking a very tiny temperature difference. And what you're looking at here is a whole sky map of the radiation left over from the cosmic creation event. But if you average out the temperatures on a large scale, what it basically shows you is that we reside in one of the cooler parts and we're moving towards one of the warmer parts. Basically makes the point that uh, this Lanakaya supercluster is existing in an underdense region of the universe. And because we're in an underdense region, the Lanakaya supercluster is being pulled towards uh, denser regions uh, within the universe. So we're being pulled toward what is called the monster attractor. And so that's described in the uh, design to the core, how we're being pulled towards uh, that monster attractor. Now the monster attractor is loaded with really deadly uh, super, super massive black holes. But one of the things that I find to be an extraordinary design feature, we're being pulled from an underdense region of the universe towards a dense region where we have all these deadly supermassive black holes, but we're being pulled in the direction of the plane of our galaxy. And the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, there is thick dust and that dust is blocking out the deadly radiation. Matter of fact, it was difficult for astronomers to discover uh, this region called the monster attractor because they had to look for it through the dust of our galaxy. But by using radio telescopes and uh, deep infrared telescopes that are able to penetrate that dust, they were able to get a clearer picture of where we're going, uh, where we're being pulled towards and what is there. Now, Things would be quite different if we were being pulled in a region away from the plane of the galaxy, because then we'd be more exposed to that radiation. But it's like we're being pulled in the direction of the plane of the galaxy, where the plane of the galaxy, unfortunately for some astronomers interested in what lies in the region to which we're being pulled, um, it's being blocked out. So all the details in the visible light part of the spectrum are largely blocked out by the dust in the lane of the plane of our galaxy. But again, at radio wavelengths, uh, we can see through that and get a good idea uh, of the uh, structure. Uh, but that's the whole point. We live in this very special super galaxy cluster, and uh, there is no super galaxy cluster far, far away that has the features for advanced life. And by the way, 
when you go through design to the core, that's a common theme. Uh, we live in a unique super galaxy cluster, the only one of the tens of thousands we observe that has the right structure, the filament structure, the subfilament structure, the low density of mass, the distribution of the galaxy clusters that makes possible advanced life uh, within our local group. And what I'll be sharing with you in subsequent weeks is that we also live in a just right galaxy cluster, a galaxy cluster and a galaxy group that's unlike any other we see anywhere in the universe. And then we live in a galaxy that's unlike any other galaxy. And we live in a just right star. For 70 years, my peers have been searching for a star that's sufficiently like our star of the sun that it could be a candidate to host a planet in which advanced life is possible. They have found many stars that are twins of one another, but they've yet to find an adequate twin of our star of the sun. And it goes on. Uh, we have the just right uh, groupings of planets. And so we now know that every planet in our solar system must be designed to make possible advanced life on Earth. And now we have found more than 5,000 planets orbiting other stars. We've yet to find a single one of those planets that has the features of any of the planets in our solar system. Not only are we not finding a twin to the Earth, we're not finding a twin to Venus, a twin to Jupiter, a twin to Saturn, Uranus, Mars, uh, Mercury, uh, Neptune. We're not finding a twin to any of the eight. And that actually led to the discovery. Every one of them must be designed to make life possible. And we live on a unique planet. We are finding planets about the mass of the Earth and orbiting roughly the same distance from their host star. But that's where the similarities end. The ones that are the most Earth-like are coming in with a water content about 500 times greater than we see here on Earth and an atmospheric density that again is about 1,000 times greater. And so one of the requirements we now know for advanced life, you have to have liquid water, but you only want a little bit of liquid water. Too much water rules out the possibility for advanced life. Too thick of an atmosphere. I mean, advanced life species that are like us here, uh, we are able to do all the activity we do because of lungs. And uh, I've got a book upstairs in my office basically making the point it's inconceivable to have a breathing system more efficient than we see in birds and mammals, the lung structure. This is where you get the most energy output uh, without damaging or limiting in a significant way the lifespan of the organism. The lungs can only operate uh, from about a third the atmospheric pressure to three times the atmospheric pressure. So if you go up to Mount Everest, the air pressure is about one third uh, what it is at sea level. And they refer to anything above 26,000 feet as a death zone, which means the air pressure is so low that if you spend more than a few hours above that altitude, you will die. The lungs will cease to be able to function enough to keep you alive. But likewise, deep sea divers have recognized that if you get an air pressure greater than three times what you have at sea level, likewise, you die. That's the range in which you must be in. And we have that range here on planet Earth. Uh, we're not seeing it in other Earth-like planets. And I'm going to have a special thing on the moon. Uh, and incidentally, what excites me most about the book, the book is predominantly dealing with discoveries that scientists have made in the last three years. And my wife will tell you, I got super excited doing the research for the book because I'd be going through the literature and saying, wow, this has got to go into the book. Uh, and this is my sixth book on fine tune, the fine tuning argument for the existence of God. But it's in this book, Designed to the Core, where I got to witness an exponential increase in evidence uh, for fine tuning that points to the God of the Bible. In my opinion, every chapter is a mind blower. Every chapter testifies that uh, the God of the Bible is the one that's responsible for the extraordinary design. Okay, I'm going to stop there. And uh, we'll take questions. And we'll alternate from the people that are here 
and those that are participating online. And I think we got somebody monitoring a computer, right? Or hopefully. And we'll take, yeah, wait for the microphone. <coughs> Two questions, sir. Is your book now uh, available now, or is it on uh, Kindle? The book, Design to the Core, will have a general release on September 1st, 2022. Okay. It's in our warehouse right here, so it's mm -hmm. available, uh, but it's available to anyone who makes a donation of any amount to Reasons to Believe. Okay. And the other question, these clusters, are they receiving from us? Okay. Expanding? Yeah. All clusters of galaxies are moving away from us because of the expansion of the universe. But how they were able to define these super galaxy clusters is looking at what they call the peculiar velocities. The peculiar velocity of a galaxy cluster or a galaxy is the velocity it's moving with respect to us where you take out the velocity due to the expansion of the universe. But if you don't take out that expansion velocity, all galaxies relative to us are redshifted except for the galaxies in the local group. Those galaxies are so close that the gravitational interactions that the galaxies have for one another is greater than the expansion, uh, the velocity due to the expansion of the universe. So for example, the Andromeda galaxy is moving towards us rather than away from us. But once you get beyond the local group, the expansion of the universe due to the Big Bang is greater than the peculiar velocities, the velocities due to the galaxies gravitationally interacting with one another. Okay. okay. Question from the virtual audience. Yeah, we have a question from Keith Wilson. What is the function of the bar in the center of galaxies? <coughs> Okay, Keith Wilson, who's joining us from New Zealand, he's asking us the question, what is the purpose of the bar and barred spiral galaxies? There are only a tiny percentage of galaxies, about 6% of the galaxies that are nearby to us are large spiral galaxies, and only a small percentage of those large spiral galaxies have what's called a barred core structure. And I'm going to just pop down and show you uh, what it is for our galaxy. Yeah, this will probably do it for you. Let me pop this up. Okay, this is a, a detailed map that astronomers have made of the structure of our Milky Way galaxy. And what you see is that core structure. And that core contains half of all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a very dense agglomeration of stars, but notice it's not a ball, it's kind of a barred structure. And uh, that barred structure is crucial in order to have what these highly symmetrical spiral arms. So only in galaxies that have a barred structure do you see symmetrical spiral arms. And that's necessary to ensure that you've got the stability in the spiral structure uh, that enables a star to exist with the planet orbiting it and which advanced life is possible. Without that barred structure, you either have a big uh, spherical core where you've got maybe 80 to 90% of the stars in that area, which produces a really massive, supermassive black hole radiating a deadly radiation, or you wind up with a, just a tiny uh, spherical core and you've got these large spiral arms that gravitationally engage one another where you don't have this uh, spiral, uh, stable, uh, symmetrical spiral structure. And this is uh, an update to what's in the book. What I have in the book is that this amazingly symmetrical spiral structure has been stable for 10 billion years. Uh, I just put up an article on our reasons.org website which updates that. We now know it's been stable for 11 billion years. So that's one of the amazing things of our Milky Way galaxy. The last time it absorbed 
uh, a relatively large dwarf galaxy was 11 billion years ago. Since then, it's only been feeding on uh, tiny dwarf galaxies. But yeah, Keith Wilson's right. Uh, for advanced light to be possible, it needs to be a spiral galaxy with a barred core structure where that barred core structure contains about half the stars in the galaxy. And to get that barred structure, uh, the galaxy has to have a certain mass range. We also see a slight barred structure in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, and maybe I can pull that up for you. Let me see if I can find an image of that. Uh, maybe not. Let me see. Ah, here we go. Okay, this shows you the Milky Way galaxy at the top and at the bottom you see the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. That large Magellanic Cloud actually ranks as the third most massive galaxy in the local group. It comes in at about 1 16th the mass of our Milky Way galaxy. It's a small spiral galaxy, but because of its small size, notice its barred structure in comparison to the rest of the galaxy is way more dominant than it is in our Milky Way galaxy. Also notice that its spiral structure is not symmetrical. It's highly distorted. And incidentally, that's the case with all small spiral galaxies. Their mass is not big enough to avoid being gravitationally disturbed by the more massive galaxies in its vicinity. The gravity of the Milky Way galaxy is significantly distorting the structure of the large Magellanic Cloud. But yeah, it does have a barred structure, uh, but it's not a candidate uh, for advanced life uh, because you don't have that long-term stability of the spiral arms. Okay, we'll take another question from the live audience if there is one. Yes, got one? Go for it. Dr. Ross, hi, this is Bud. So you were just uh, sharing that there's new evidence that our spiral has been stable for 11 billion years. 11, yeah, we've added a billion years. Yeah, it's amazing. <clears throat> so I'm aware that the uh, halo of, a large halo of, of exotic dark matter plays a role in keeping that spiral yes, structure stable. Is there, is there sort of, along with this new evidence of the length of the stability, is there some new evidence regarding well, the, the new evidence comes from what they Thank call subgiant stars. Uh, they're, the, they're the kind of star that have gone through their nuclear fuel, uh, or pardon me, they're coming down onto the uh, main sequence, and uh, the rate at which they come down means that we can get a very accurate estimate of their age. And so this new result is based on looking at a quarter of a million of these subgiant stars in the halo of our galaxy. And so they were able to come up with a new date uh, because the date that we had of the last major merger event with our Milky Way galaxy was 10 to 10.5 billion years ago. And that's the date you'll see in design to the core. Uh, but it's based on less reliable or less accurate uh, dating methods. What's brand new is this huge survey of subdwarf stars in our galaxy uh, where they got a precision date, which basically says that last uh, merger event, merger with a large dwarf galaxy, happened 11 billion years ago, not 10 to 10 and a half billion. Now, what you'll see in the book, when I said 10 to 10 and a half billion, the error bar was plus or minus 1 billion. The error bar now is down to a tenth of a billion. So they got a really accurate date. That's what's new. And people ask me, are you eventually going to put out a second edition of design to the core? Yeah. Enough has been discovered already. I could come up with a second edition. But I'm going to wait a little bit before we do that. OK. Um, another question from the virtual audience? Yes. Uh, Valerie Durham asks, will the James Webb Telescope be able to detect exoplanets in galaxies beyond our Milky Way galaxy. Okay, uh, 
Astronomers already have detected planets uh, in the Andromeda galaxy. They do it through gravitational lensing. And so what that means is uh, you're using what's called microlensing, uh, where you've got a star uh, between your telescope and a more distant star. But they have to perfectly line up in order to be able to image a planet uh, orbiting about that more distant star. Now, uh, for that to have any hope of success, you have to be looking towards a place where you've got a very high density of stars. Well, the center of the Andromeda galaxy is a place where you've got an extremely high density of stars. And so, by looking for a star that's between us and the center of the Andromeda galaxy, you do have a chance of uh, gravitationally lensing a planet that's orbiting that star. Now, they have found a handful. The James Webb Space Telescope will be able to find a lot more. I don't think that's scheduled for the immediate future. Uh, what's got a higher priority for the James Webb Space Telescope is to actually uh, chemically analyze the atmosphere of uh, planets that are most like uh, planet Earth that are orbiting other stars. Uh, with the telescopes we've had so far, we just get a rough handle on what the chemistry of the atmospheres of these stars are. James Webb will be able to do, give us a detailed look at the chemistry of the atmosphere and how thick the atmosphere is, what its air pressure is. So that's, that's high on the priority list of uh, projects for the James Webb Space Telescope because there's a lot of astrobiologists that are really interested in getting a detailed look at the atmospheres mm -hmm. of planets. Uh, well, especially the rocky planets. We have another online question. Okay. Uh, Robert Gibson, will the oscillations of the solar system in our galaxy bring us in and out of the plane of our galaxy to expose us to the nasty radiation from the monster attractor? Well, uh, what Rob Gibson is referring to He's a member of our uh, Reasons to Believe Chicago chapter. Um, and, uh, you know, as our sun orbits about the center of our galaxy, it actually experiences some up and down movement. So we go above the plane, then down into the plane, and above the plane again. Uh, what I do describe in design to the core is one of the unique features of our star, the sun, is that its up and down movement relative to the plane is quite tiny. Most stars in the Milky Way galaxy, uh, as they orbit about the center of our galaxy, move considerably above the plane and down the plane. One of the unique features of the sun is it doesn't get very far away from the plane. So we basically stay well protected uh, from uh, the deadly radiation uh, as we look towards the region of the monster attractor. However, uh, as we go up and down relative to that plane, we do get more exposed to the radiation coming out of the supermassive black hole uh, that's in our galaxy. That's only 26,000 light years away. The supermassive black holes in the direction of the monster attractor, they're millions and tens of millions of light years away. And so that is a problem. As our star goes up and down relative to the plane, uh, it gets more or less exposed <coughs> to radiation coming out of the four million solar mass black hole at the center of our galaxy. Uh, and uh, as we go into the future, we're going to get more exposed. And uh, right now, uh, and you'll see this uh, in design to the core, is that the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy currently is extraordinarily quiet. Now, what makes supermassive black holes dangerous, I mean, black holes themselves aren't dangerous because they suck everything into it. They really don't radiate anything. We call them black. However, their gravity pulls in gas and dust, uh, comets, asteroids, planets, and stars uh, towards its event horizon. And as all this matter gets drawn in uh, towards that part of the black hole where it's black, that's what they call the event horizon, 
the distance from the black hole uh, where nothing can escape, not even light itself. But as the matter is being pulled in towards the event horizon, the gravitational energy there is sufficient to transform the incoming mass into pure energy uh, with anything from 5% to 42% efficiency. And to put that in context, the nuclear furnace in the core of our sun is converting matter into energy with 0.07% efficiency. And so these supermassive black holes can literally be converting matter into energy with 42% efficiency. The faster the black hole rotates, uh, the more efficiently it transforms the matter that's falling towards its event horizon into energy. But what you'll see in design of the core is astronomers have had detailed observations of what's happening uh, outside the event horizon of our Milky Way galaxy supermassive black hole. They literally see several flares uh, per day, sometimes per hour, but they're tiny flares, uh, which they calculate are flares as a result of, uh, well, they do see gas being pulled in, so there's a steady background, but then there's these little blips. And the little blips they attribute to the supermassive black hole uh, sucking in uh, objects as big as small asteroids and small comets. But the amount of radiation that pours out as a result is not an issue for advanced life. But you'll also see a figure. Matter of fact, I can even show it to you. I'll jump ahead here for you so that you can see it. Here we go. This is an X-ray image, a gamma ray and X-ray image of the center of our galaxy, basically showing these huge bubbles of X-ray and gamma ray radiation that are connected through chimneys, X-ray chimneys, to the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And these bubbles are expanding. And the rate at which they're expanding tells us that several million years ago, that black hole sucked in something the mass of a star. And when that happens, you get a huge eruption of energy. But because that happened millions of years ago, uh, and that these bubbles are so big, they pose zero threat to advanced life here on planet Earth. But an answer to the question uh, from uh, uh, Rob Gibson is that things were a lot more dangerous in the past and are likely to be more dangerous in the future. We happen to be in a time window right now where a supermassive black hole basically is only taking into its uh, event horizon tiny objects, gas, dust, and an occasional small comet or small asteroid, and therefore uh, things are safe for advanced life here on planet Earth. But they weren't safe in the past, and given the density of stars and planets in the vicinity of the center of our galaxy, it's not going to be safe much more into the future. But we're here in a safe zone. And what I think makes it all the more miraculous, astronomers have also determined that the much larger supermassive black hole <coughs> in the Andromeda galaxy, 35 times bigger than the one in our Milky Way galaxy, right now it too is in a quiet phase. So two coincidences. Our supermassive black hole is in the quietest phase it's ever been. Likewise, a supermassive black hole in the Andromeda galaxy is in the quietest phase it's ever been. And those two phases perfectly overlap, making it possible uh, for us to exist. Now, we do know there were hominids wandering around the Earth when that event was exploding. Uh, but because uh, there was simply a small population of Stone Age hominids, uh, it didn't affect it probably affected their health. It probably limited how long they could live, but it would certainly limit their capability of being able to launch any civilization or technology. Not that they had the brain capacity to do it, but when God created humans, he made sure that we had a quiet enough episode for a supermassive black hole that we could launch and sustain advanced civilization. You think any of those indeed. oscillations are related 
to past mass extinctions? Yes, well actually uh, it is true that if you go above the plane you get exposed to, more exposed to the radiation from the supermassive black hole, but a bigger problem is when you go through the plane. And right now, we're not exactly in the plane. Uh, we're a little bit above the plane, uh, but when you actually go through the plane of our galaxy, that's where you got the greatest density of stars and particularly giant molecular clouds, dense giant molecular clouds, and there's evidence that every time uh, we've gone through, we go through the plane of our galaxy about once every 30 to 35 million years. That 30 to 35 million years coincides with the frequency of mass extinction events. And so what astronomers are surmising is that when our solar system goes through the plane, it encounters these dense giant molecular clouds which disturbs the Oort belt of comets the Kuiper belt of asteroids and comets and results in a more intense uh, collision rate of big asteroids and comets uh, on the Earth. And most of the mass extinction events that we can study in detail, the extinction was a direct result of uh, Earth uh, experiencing major impactor events. Okay, well thank you. And I don't think there's any more questions. Well, we're at about the end of our time anyway, so. Doing my job. All right. Can you close us in prayer? I'll then, close please. us in prayer. And uh, people are welcome to any questions they come up, they're welcome to bring them up next time. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for being alive in the 21st century when we get to witness these amazing discoveries. Yes, the heavens declared the glory of God to Abraham, uh, to Isaac, uh, Lord, to Moses because they had such clear skies, they didn't have to deal with light pollution or air pollution, so they got to see with their naked eye something that no one on planet Earth can see. But we have the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, we have the Atacama Array in Chile. We have telescopes all over the world that are giving us a view of the glory of God revealed in the heavens, the righteousness of God revealed in the heavens, as it says in Psalm 97. We thank you for the privilege of being able to witness uh, your amazing design miracles that make possible our existence at this brief time. I pray, Father, that this would humble us. We would recognize what you've invested in us uh, and therefore realize you must have a very high purpose and destiny for each human being that you created. Help us to find that purpose and density. Thank you, you gave each of us a different purpose a different destiny. Help us to find it so we can serve and please you to the fullest of our efforts. And in particular, Father, I pray that you would give us encounters with people who don't yet know you as Creator, Lord, and Savior, that we'd be able to share uh, some of these evidences for your glory and your righteousness, that they too uh, can become members of your family and become children of God. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>